Oh boy, am I recording? Oh yes, we are. On a cock that's hard as a rock. I think I said that wrong. On the clock and write a rock. That's the one. That's the one I was looking for. Before we even start off, like, y'all have been killing it with the beginner's guide, which is super duper awesome. Y'all have also been eating alive. Uh, <laughs> uh, the short that I kind of uploaded, uh, someone sent that to me. I thought it was fucking hilarious, and I honestly thought, well, that's me during Phasmophobia. Another few things before I begin. Number one, I do have a Discord. Uh, link will be in the description below. Second thing, of course, Twitch, live every single day from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, because of my pneumonia, I did kind of have to end up, uh, ending a bit early. I'm feeling a lot better, though that being said, I've still got a little bit of phlegm and crap in my chest. I've been coughing out. Uh, I spent the entirety of yesterday just doing that at the time I'm recording this. Third and final thing, donation goal is still a thing. Uh, the donation goal, which I've talked about several times, it is... So Merlin, the guy who made these beautiful emotes that you're seeing up on screen, uh, unfortunately his drawing tablet broke and I am doing a donation goal in hopes to actually help him get a new drawing tablet. Link to where you can donate to that in the description. But anyways, let's go ahead and move on to the advanced guide. I've been putting this off for way too long. Honestly, it's been a lot longer than it should have been, but... Here I am. We're actually just going to go ahead and get this done. And why is my audio muted? God, God, let's get this stuff on. Now, I'm at the slowdown screen because we've got some other stuff to talk about. Because as you can see, I've got some, uh, some of the newer stuff. I don't have all of the tier 3. I do know Phasmo did their whole thing where they gave us achievements and all of that. I need to get all the tier 3 stuff for the achievement. But let's go ahead and get on to the first bit of our tutorial. So, we covered in the last bit about everything you need to know about being a beginner. Like, and we're talking a beginner as in, this is your first time playing, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. This is a guide based off of, you've gotten some hours in, you kind of know what you're doing. Well, not even kind of, you, you know your way around the game. You, you can basically go into a game for the most part and, uh, you know, get the ghost, right? But you may not necessarily be professional, let's say, right? You are still, there's still some stuff you want to learn. There's still some stuff you kind of want to know about the game. Now, the way how this tutorial is going to work here is this is going to cover a lot of the technical stuff, but not with the ghosts. I feel like it would be better off if the ghosts, every ghost in Phasmophobia gets their own little five minute video. That way this video isn't like an hour long. And anything you need to know about any ghost, you can just watch the video on. You don't have to skip ahead and like, oh, well, this is the part where he said this about this ghost. No, no, no. Every ghost in this game is just going to get their own little dedicated, like, five-minute video telling you every little thing you need to know about that ghost. So that's how we're going to do that. First things first, truck camping. Stop it. All right? D don't do that. Don't. Now, when I mean truck camping, I don't mean... Well, I went to the truck to look for orbs and for dots. That's one thing, all right? Truck camping, on the other hand, is not that. Truck camping is you are sitting on the truck for the entire fucking game. You are that one kid where it's just like, GUYS! GUYS! Activity level 1! Oh my god, it's activity level 3! Oh, 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 activity level 4! Activity level 4! Activity level 4! Oh, oh, it's level 2! It's activity level zero, we're good. That did not feel good to do when you have a lot of sludge in your chest and throat, but you're still trying to get the remaining of it out. We've all encountered that one kid in the game, all right? Does not move, is always feeling the need to tell you the obvious. Oh, it's activity level two. That doesn't help me. But also, whenever the ghost is hunting, activity level 10, guys, uh, 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 I, I think it's hunting, right? Again, don't be a truck camper, all right? Don't be that guy. Understandable if you are scared. If you're scared, you, you don't want to go into the house. Understandable. But that's acceptable for, like, only a few rounds. After that, I mean, come on. Grow a fucking pair and actually get out of a house, all right? Or get out of a truck and into the house, all right? It's time. Once you reach, like, level 20 in the game, you have no fucking excuse to actually just sit around and do nothing. So tip number one, stop truck camping and actually be a good player, all right? Be a teammate. Go out and actually help. Right, so for the next parts of this tutorial, 
we are going to go ahead and talk about our cursed possession. So we're going to go into single player. We're actually going to change this back into professional because let's be real, if we're doing a professional guide, chances are, if you know a lot about the game, professional is probably the mode you're playing. We're going to go back to Tanglewood and I will see you all when we are there on the truck. Let's first talk about cursed possessions because I did get into that very, very briefly, but I didn't really talk about them that much. The first thing we're going to go out and do is we're not here to actually figure out the ghost. I mean, we can, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm also kind of just looking for the bone just because I can, but I mean, there's not really used to it. So let's talk about the cursed possession here. All right, music box. What does this music box do? So what the music box does is, oh, uh, go and get a photo of this one. So how the music box works, right? And uh, may not necessarily be the best idea to do here. How it works is when you turn it on, there will be a song playing. Now when that song plays, it will... Shut up. When that song plays, what will happen is uh, a tune will start to play, right? And you will hear the ghost. When you are near the ghost, all right? You will hear it begin to sing, all right? From wherever the ghost is at. So in this case, the ghost is in the garage. So if I were to turn it on and I were to walk closer to the ghost, the ghost singing would become louder. And there will reach a certain point where you get close enough to the ghost. What will end up happening is uh, the ghost will enter a ghost event state and it will walk towards the music box, all right? And for five seconds, all right, if that music box, uh, it'll do that for five seconds, all right? And after the five seconds, all right, if a ghost is unable to touch the music box within that five seconds, it'll initiate a hunt, all right? If you run out of sanity while using the music box, because here's something else to note about music boxes. They use a lot of sanity while you are around the music box while it's giving off uh, its tune, all right? So if you run out of sanity while holding the music box, it'll make a sound and what'll end up happening is it'll just initiate a hunt, all right? If a ghost touches the music box within that five seconds, you'll hear the same sound, it'll hunt, right? And uh, if you pick up the music box, but rather than place it down on the ground, if you throw it, it will initiate a hunt, all right? And in particular, a cursed hunt. Now, cursed hunts... Hi there. I'm just going to walk out for a moment. So, the way how Cursed Hunts works, we've kind of talked about this. I, I don't know if I briefly went over it, but just in case I didn't. So, how Cursed Hunts work is, so we talked about how in Hunts, there is a grace period. And during that grace period, the ghost will stand still and won't be visible for a certain amount of time. And that grace period is dependent off of what difficulty you are playing on. However, with Cursed Hunts, all grace periods are sent to one second, and the hunts last an additional, I think it's like 15 seconds, something like that, or at least on small maps, right? So on a small map on Professional, hunts last 30 seconds, but during a Cursed Hunt, they'll last an additional 15 seconds, I believe. Um, if that's not right, I'll make sure to do some Googling and then put it up on the screen. All right, and that's for all cursed possessions, except for the monkey paw. That is the music box, all right? But let's talk about the mirror, which is the other thing I got a photo of. Now, the mirror is a, uh, mirror is useful, but it's also a bit fickle. So how it works is when you use the music box, I'm not gonna use it to keep my sanity up, all right? But when you use the music box, what happens, or not the music box, when you use a cursed mirror, all right, what'll end up happening is when you use it, or I guess I'll use it real quick. But just like that, I was able to see where the ghost was. However, there's a bit of a caveat to that. Whenever you first use the haunted mirror, you'll immediately use up 20% of your sanity just like that. So notice how I'm now at 70%, meaning when I was in the house at one point, I lost around 10% sanity. Well, I just lost an additional 20% just by using the mirror alone. Plus, I think it's an additional 7% sanity every second 
that you use the mirror. So every second that the mirror is used, you're losing an additional 7% sanity on top of that 20% from the initial use. Tarot cards. Honestly, probably the most useless items in the game, uh, which seems kind of weird, but I'm about to explain to you, but I'll go ahead and explain it. So tarot cards, there are a few cards in this deck. All right, and with these few cards, you pull them, and whatever card gets pulled up, it will do a certain effect. So let's start with the most common one, which is going to be the tower. Tower means a ghost will interact with something, all right? So it can touch a light, um, or, you know, flick a light switch, you know, touch a door, you know, throw something, interact with the breaker, or even interact with items like, let's say, dots or ghost writing. That is what the tower will do. It will immediately force an interaction. Next card we can talk about is going to be the Hermit. All the Hermit does is lock a ghost in its room for a short amount of time. It's nothing really too crazy. Then there is also, um, what was the other one I just thought of? Oh yeah, so the next one is the Devil. The Devil means you're going to get a ghost event, and it's a random ghost event too. But the Devil can be a little bit useful if you're trying to get a photo of the ghost. Um, assuming you don't just get like an airball ghost event, you know, you can easily get a ghost event just like that. After that, we have the Wheel of Fortune. Now, what is the Wheel of Fortune? So, there are two different effects you can have with the Wheel of Fortune. And that depends based off of what color it burns, alright? No other card, like, every card will just kind of have her own little color to burn. Um, both colors don't matter. The only color that matters when the card burns is the Wheel of Fortune. If it burns red, you lose 25% sanity. If it burns green, you gain 25% sanity. All right, that's the only card where if it burns a specific color, it's the only one that matters. All right, then there is the sun. The sun means you have gained 100% sanity, but the moon means you've lost all of your sanity. Then there is the death card. The death card means that the ghost is going to initiate a cursed hunt. All right? So death means hunt specifically because it's a cursed object, cursed hunt. All right? Then there then there's a probably the one card that everyone hates to see, the hanged man. Uh nobody wants to see this card get pulled up. There's a 1% chance of it being drawn, but for whatever reason it always seems to be more common than the best card you could draw in the game. The hanged man immediately kills you. Doesn't matter what your sanity is, doesn't matter what the ghost is, you pull that card, you will die. So Hangman is the worst card to find in the deck. But then there's the best card you can find, and that is the High Priestess, which revives a random player. And then there's the one card that always gives everyone a heart attack, and then kind of fills them with either relief, or it does the exact opposite, where we're just like, oh yes, I got this card, and then it's like, oh damn it. Because the card we're talking about is the Fool. So the Fool happens. So the Fool is one of those cards that, um, so let's say you're trying to get a ghost event, right? And you pull a Devil. But you don't get a ghost event because the, car, because the card immediately changes into a Fool. The Fool, basically what happens is it'll pop up after any effect gets put, or like any effect that the card shows is going to happen. And it'll immediately pop up afterwards. It's kind of like a haha, just kidding. Uh, that's kind of how the the hangman or not the hangman. That's how the fool works. It is a haha. -ha, just kidding card and then uh, The only other way a fool can pull up so um, Something to know about fool cards is when the ghost is hunting every card will be a fool So just keep in mind if you're drawing a bunch of cards that are getting a bunch of fools check to see if a ghost is hunting So you might be wondering why I said like oh the, the tarot cards are the worst items in the game. Now, why is that? And the reason for that is because the tarot cards are completely random. So you could just pull a bunch of tower cards, a bunch of hermits, and a bunch of fools and not get anything that you were hoping for. Or the first card could be a hangman and you don't even get a high priestess, all right? Like, that's why tarot cards are the worst cards in, or the worst cursed object in the game, like by far. Let's move on to the monkey paw. I actually don't remember all of the effects off the top of my head. So basically how the monkey paw works is you have a certain amount of wishes, all right? And you just say, I wish for so-and-so. You can change the weather. You can put yourself at 50% sanity, right? You can even get the ghost to do a ghost event or 
in some case, or in one case, if you really want to, you can rule out an evidence. However, because it's a monkey paw, that means there's a catch. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put the stuff up on screen because I actually don't fucking remember all the effects on top of my head. So, uh, anyways, that is, just take a look. But yeah, that is the effects of the monkey paw. Let's move on to the next cursed objects right here. I'm just going to go down here because both of them are here and we might as well knock them off. So, the summoning circle summons the ghost. I know, hard to believe. But how it summons the ghost is, first off, you need to have around, I think it's 85% sanity. Um, so, let's say you use all your sanity pills and you're at 50% sanity, you will not be able to use a summoning circle. So... You can't, if you have a summoning circle, um, you kind of have to have a lot of sanity for it to work. But keeping your sanity high in this game is really not that difficult. So, how it works is you light each and every single one of these candles. When you light each and every single one of those candles, I think it's like 16 or 17% sanity, something around that. I don't actually remember. But you need around like it's either 84 or 85% sanity around that amount. And when you light every candle, right, you're losing your sanity. And when all candles are lit, the ghost will appear right in the center. And what will end up happening is it will stand there for just a moment. And during that time, you can get a photo of the ghost. If you want to put salt underneath so you can uh, get feet print of a photo, you can do that. Um, what's nice is that you do get a uh, ghost event because what when the ghost is standing here, it is considered a ghost event. So you can do that. You can get objective done, right? But then, after around three-ish seconds, the ghost will break free, and it will initiate its cursed hunt. Now, a few other things. Uh, if the ghost is already hunting, and you light the circle, the ghost is actually just going to teleport here, but it's not going to stay still. No, it's immediately going to start moving. So if the ghost is hunting up there, and I'm lighting the circle, right, and the last one's here, uh, and I light it while it's hunting, it's going to pretty much immediately kill me because it's just going to immediately move to me and I'm not going to have any time to, like, run by the time I realize, oh, fuck, it's hunting and it's right in front of my face moving right at me. So, one of the things you should do is before you use the curse, or before you use the summoning circle, number one, make sure you have 100% sanity. But then number two, or, as you know, at least as high sanity as you can get, at least above 85%, right? But number two, whatever room the ghost is in, make sure to smudge it, all right? Make sure the ghost is smudged, so in the event that when you are lighting the circle, the ghost won't accidentally hunt the board. Now, how does a board work? So, the board works by you turning on, you turning it on, like, just like this, all right? And you ask it a question. Now, certain questions use up certain sanity, all right? So, all cursed possessions will take a toll on your sanity. The board is uh so when you ask the ghost like let's say you were to ask the ghost where are you now important to know the ghost will not tell you what its ghost room is because there are people who have asked like hey what is your favorite room and it'll tell you its room all right the ghost does not tell you what its favorite room is it'll tell you where it's at in the moment but it will not tell you what its favorite room is all right and that question uses 50 percent sanity that's a lot you can also ask the question of where is the bone also uses 50% sanity all right but then there are certain questions um, that don't use up a lot of sanity like how old are you um, I think that uses up like 20% sanity that's honestly not too much at all right and then there's a uh, fun questions like Marco 
and it'll spell out polo, right? You can ask it, why are you here? How did you die? Um, you can also ask the question, do you, uh, question, do you respond to everyone? Right? And it'll ask if, you know, also you can ask it, uh, when did you die? And it'll tell you how long ago in years that it died. Um, that's basically how the Ouija board works. Now, a few things to know. When you use the Ouija board, make sure, all right, that when you are done using it, you say goodbye. Because if you were to run away, what will end up happening is you get a certain distance away from that board, it will initiate a hunt, all right, and that cursed hunt too. On top of that, if you were asking a board a question, let's say you have 40% sanity and you ask the ghost where it is. You don't have 50% sanity, and in fact, uh, you'll be at 0% sanity. Once you reach 0% sanity, the board will immediately break. It will not answer the question. It will immediately destroy itself, and the curse hunt will begin. Now, on top of that, with the board, you can ask it a particular question, which is hide and seek. Well, it's not really a question, but you can tell the board hide and seek. And it'll count down from five, four, three, two, one. And once it reaches one, the ghost will hunt. It will break the board, FYI. Um, but if you want the ghost to hunt, and uh, let's say you didn't get a photo of the board yet, or let's say you're wanting to get an interaction, which by the way, the board does give off EMF levels. So you can get EMF 5 with a board, and you can also get photos of the interaction. However, a uh, big problem with the board is that interactions are kind of broken, and I don't recommend getting... Um, I don't remember, uh, recommend getting photos of it because there are times where you'll take photos of a board, it'll count the interaction, but then the other half of the time, it just it will not give it to you. So interactions with the board are broken. So I don't recommend you actually get interactions with the board because a lot of times it just doesn't work at all. Oh, it's a mare. <laughs> uh, well, first off, I know what the ghost is. Um, did not mean to do that mare. It is a mare. Um, there's a reason for that. I'm not really going to get into it. Uh, like I said, they'll have its own dedicated video, but I know it's a mare. I mean, technically it could be a mimic, but um, let's talk about the doll. So the doll that I just took a photo of. So, so how the doll works is, so when you're holding it and you use it, a random pin will get pulled and each pin uses 5% sanity, except for one pin, which is a heart pin, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But what happens is when you're pulling pins and it's not a heart pin, it will force the ghost to interact with something. Much like the tower card, it will interact with anything. However, when you pull the heart pin, what'll end up happening is it'll use 10% sanity, number one. But number two, that initiates a cursed hunt. Keep that in mind, you don't get to control which pin you press, it's all random. Now on top of that, let's say you only have like 20% sanity, and you pull five pins, all right? Well, what'll end up happening is the rest of those five pins will immediately, all the, or not, well, all the pins will immediately get pulled, right? And the ghost will interact with a bunch of stuff all at once, but then what'll also end up happening is the ghost will immediately hunt. <laughs> so again, make sure you have all of the sanity when it comes to uh, the cursed possessions because most likely you'll just end up getting screwed over <laughs> and probably killed unexpectedly. That is all of the cursed possessions wrapped up. Let's talk about total activity. Now we do have a mare and I can't show this off, but I can show off a few clips talking about what I'm about to tell you, all right? So what is the total activity graph? So how the total activity graph works is whenever the ghost does something, whatever it does will be displayed. Now, when I mean interacting, I'm talking about with the EMF reader because how this works is whenever the ghost is doing anything, I'll give you an example. Let's say it touches a door. Your EMF level will always be a two. Whenever it touches a door or turns on a light switch, you know, stuff like that, always EMF two. Whenever it uses its ability or hidden ability, it'll also be an EMF level two. Whenever you're using, let's say, the board, for example, all right, it'll always give you an EMF level 2. Unless the ghost has an EMF 5, there is a chance it will give you EMF 5, all right? But whenever it comes to basic interactions, all right, whether it's writing in a book, touching a door, light switch, 
Ouija board, you know, cursed objects, all that, right? Hidden abilities or even just regular abilities, always EMF level 2. Whenever the ghost throws something, doesn't matter what it throws, it'll always be EMF level 3 unless it's a poltergeist. Then it'll be a 2 because that's a hidden ability. Actually, it might be a 3. I don't remember. But yeah, whenever a ghost throws something, always EMF level 3. Whenever the ghost does a ghost event, ghost events will always be EMF level 4. Unless, of course, it's EMF level 5 ghost because then there's a chance that it will give you EMF 5. And uh, EMF5, I mean, it happens just out of random. It can happen from anything. If you, uh, one thing to know about EMF5, it is impossible to get EMF5 during a hunt. You've seen people talk about, well, how do you know it's EMF level 5 when you see it on the chart? And there's a reason for that. So, I'll talk about the single player and then the multiplayer portion. How the chart works is whenever the ghost does something. So notice in this case, we got an EMF level 2, meaning the ghost most likely touched a door or did something, all right? Except that might not even necessarily be the case because how total activity works is, let's say the ghost touches something, all right? Normally that should be EMF level two. However, how total activity works is it uses an algorithm and that algorithm is whatever it does, subtract one. So it would then show up as a one and then add an additional modifier of either adding one, doing nothing or subtracting one. So it's possible that the ghost is doing something right now, but it's just at zero. That is 100% possible. It could be doing, it could be touching a door right now, but we can't see it because it subtracted one and then applied the modifier of subtract one again. And as a result, we're not seeing it. Whenever a ghost does a ghost event, all right, important to know, a ghost event cannot happen if nobody is in the house. So if you see an EMF level four, and nobody is in the house, that is an impossible value. Most likely, it is EMF level 5. However, okay, and notice this, all right? EMF level 1. So it applied a modifier of subtract 1 and then do nothing. So if a ghost just touched a door, flicked on a light switch. Well, actually, it couldn't flick on a light switch because it's a, it's a mare. If no one's in the house and you're not going up against a poltergeist, It is EMF level 5. Now, if it's multiplayer, and let's say someone is in the house, all right, and you do get a 4, what you do is you radio over. Hey, did you guys just get a ghost event? And then they might radio back, yes or no, we didn't. Now, if they say yes, then disregard that EMF 5 going through your head, all right? But if they say no, what you do is you radio back, Okay, well, we got a level 4 spike on the board, so it's possible there might be EMF 5. Now, if you see a 5 spike on the board, I mean, that is, like, definite EMF 5. Now, that being said, I will say, whenever it comes to stuff like that, don't see it once and then say, oh, it's EMF 5, all right? If I were you, all right, the smart move to do is... See if you see it happen multiple times because, again, a ghost could just do something really, really quickly in quick succession. And then, because activity stacks up, right? If a ghost does something, so the activity records everything that's happening in a second, all right? So whenever, uh, so let's say that the, like, you know, the ghost touches a door both times in quick succession, it might show up as a level four, all right? Um, now also take a look in this case sometimes an EMF level 3 might be an EMF level 5 because here's a thing all right the ghost or the modifier was a minus one after total activity already modified it to a subtract one so as a result it might EMF level 3 might show up as an EMF level 5 but yeah basically in a nutshell total activity takes any interactions that the ghost is doing inside the house right and then applies an algorithm of minus one plus an additional modifier of plus one, do nothing, or minus one. And on top of that, if you see a four or five spike, that means it is, it could be EMF level five, all right? Whenever the ghost is hunting, it's always gonna show up as a 10. Now, another little interesting thing about total activity, um, this doesn't really matter, but activity can actually get above 10, because here's the thing. 10 is just a baseline for hunting, but during that time, it could throw a lot as well as touch doors and open them. So the activity can actually go higher. We just can't see it. 
But yeah, total activity can go higher. Now, sanity, we've talked about this in the other guide, but of course, this is your sanity. The only one that really matters is your average, unless you're going up against the Banshee. Again, there'll be another video talking about the Banshee. But the only thing you really need to know, like I said, is the general rule is when your sanity is at 50% or lower, all or you know any ghost can hunt of course there are ghosts that go again like there are ghosts that are an exception right they don't follow that rule just understand for the most part again just a little recap any sanity if your sane is below 50 you are in danger one last thing to talk about um i don't know if i have any footage on the total activity but there is such thing as a twin slant so the twins there's such thing as a twin interaction where one twin will interact with something and almost immediately after the twin will in, uh, interact but It'll be at a slight enough delay where it'll look like this and then kind of suddenly slant off like that. So it's kind of two different interactions, technically. But they were in close enough to succession to where there's a slight slant. They still kind of stack up on each other. You'll know it when you see it. It's very, very subtle. Uh, I'll probably just put a picture up on the screen so you know what to look for. But just know that whenever you see that, there's a chance it's a Twins. It's not guaranteed, but usually when you see something like that, it's a Twins. We've talked about all of these screens here. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the objects here that are sitting right here. Aside from the equipment, we've talked all about this stuff in the beginner episode. Let's talk about this stuff over here. So I guess we could, should start off with uh, your defenses. Now, you did see me take one of these. These are your sanity pills. So... How do sanity pills work? So whenever you are low on sanity, aside from using the tarot cards, there is no, or I guess technically the monkey paw, there is no other way for you to get sanity in the game, all right? Standing in the light does not gain you sanity. It only pauses your sanity. Same thing with being on the truck. Uh, same thing with candles. They don't stop your sanity from lowering. They used to, not anymore. But the only thing you can really do about your sanity is stop it by staying in a room with a main light. So when I mean main light, all right, oh, the, the mayor turned off the breaker. It's also touching the car. So when I'm standing in this light here, my sanity is stopping completely. It is not draining any. At first they made it to where if you were standing in a room, you had to be like right underneath the light for your sanity to not drain. They have changed that. Now, if a main light is on, when I mean a main light, I'm talking about a light switch just like this your sanity will be stopped completely. However, standing right here does not fully drain your sanity because this is not considered a main light. It is considered a lamp. So your sanity is draining, but it's only draining uh, at like, um, I think it's only draining at like 80% of a speed or whatever, something like that, right? But it's draining at 80% of a speed that it usually would. So it'll take a lot longer for your sanity to lower but it's still lowering but here when i'm standing you know my sanity is good if i'm standing here my sanity is draining a little bit less but not fully and of course i'm just standing here without the lights on at all my sanity is lowering completely that is how uh that is how um your sanity drains or if you get hit with a uh, a ghost uh, like you know a ghost event that's also how your sanity drains so when your sanity is draining and you're in danger the way how you get your sanity back is by using a pill now you cannot use a pill if your sanity is at 95 all right if your sanity is at 95 you will not be able to take a pill however if you are at let's say 90 percent sanity and you take a pill you'll be able to take it but it's a waste all right because we're going to be talking about professional in particular and on professional difficulty, when you're taking a pill, it will restore 30% of your sanity. But that's, again, like I said, a bit of a waste. It's very inefficient with your uh, with your sanity medication. You're better off working, uh, waiting until you're around, like, 30% sanity. The next thing to know about sanity is the different tiers of sanity. So, I have the tier 2 right here. I'm waiting to get the tier 3, especially for the achievements. I just want to go and get that done. But with the tier 1 sanity, how it works is... When you take sanity, sanity used to be instant. It is no longer instant, by the way. So how it works now is um, it gives you sanity over time. So with tier one, it takes you 30 seconds for the sanity to do its full effect. So in professional, it takes 30 seconds for the sanity to give you 30% of your sanity back. If you're using tier two, it'll take you 20 seconds to get that sanity back. 
And with tier 3, it takes you 10 seconds, plus you get unlimited sprint during those 10 seconds, which is massive, all right? So if you're trying to get away from the ghost during a hunt, or let's say you're wanting to get your sanity back, but you're also wanting to kind of like get some evidence quickly, and you just want to get to the house or to the ghost room quickly, you can use that to your advantage. So that is how sanity works. That's all about the same occasion. That's pretty much everything you need to know. Smudge sticks, uh, the, again, depending on what smudge stick you get, it will kind of have different effects. So the smudge stick, how it works is when you smudge the ghost, all right? Let's say not during a hunt, all right? Smudging a ghost in general, what it will do is it will prevent a ghost from hunting for a minute and 30 seconds. This does not apply to the demon and also the spirit. With the spirits, it will double that time, all right, to three minutes. And with the demon, it'll uh, reduce that time to only 60 seconds. So if you're trying to prevent a ghost from hunting without, let's say you don't have any crucifixes, but you want to prevent the smudge from doing its thing, what you do is you, you smudge it and you get around a minute 30. Now, important to know, smudge stick effects, they do not stack, all right? Meaning if you smudge a ghost and you smudge it again, what'll just end up happening is it'll reset the timer. So let's say you smudge the ghost and you smudge it again. Like let's say five seconds later, you're it's only gonna add like maybe like five seconds because you did apply the smudge effect again, but it doesn't stack. So it won't really do much at all. Now during the time that the ghost is smudged, it will also slightly increase the activity of the ghost during like, you know, its effects, right? So smudging a ghost, if a ghost is being a little inactive and you're wanting to get a little bit more activity out of it, you can smudge it to get a little bit of a boost of activity. Now during a hunt, that's where things get interesting. When you're first starting off, there's a little bit of a misconception that the ghost will try to avoid you when you have a crucifix in your hand. The ghost does not care about a crucifix when it's in your hand during a hunt. However, if you have a smudge stick, let's talk about tier one. So all it will do is make the ghost run away and blind it for an additional six seconds. So essentially what will end up happening is, let's say I am, uh, let's say I'm standing right here in the hallway, all right? And the ghost rounds a corner, all right? None of these hiding spots right here are open. I mean, this one is, but let's say it isn't, right? So what I could do is when the ghost looks at me, I wait for the ghost to get close to me. I would say maybe around here. What I do is I then smudge the ghost and then run to a hiding spot. Now, understand that during the time that you smudge it, all right, the ghost will, um, whatever speed it's at, and we're talking about tier one, whatever speed it's at, it will stay at that speed, all right? And during that time, the ghost will also remember what your last known location is. So if you smudge it right here, all right, the ghost is going to realize that, okay, this is your last known location because this is where it saw you before it got smudged. It essentially puts the ghost into a uh, its wandering stage for six seconds, all right? You get six seconds to run away and get to a hiding spot. Now, because the ghost will remember your last known location, it's not a good idea to smudge the ghost right here, all right? Let's say the ghost sees you go in here and then you smudge it. This isn't really a good hiding spot because the ghost did remember your last known location is in the closet and even if you smudge it and you hold that door shut because it knows you are in that closet because it knows that is your last known location it will come in and kill you so smudge sticks do not negate the whole like last known location thing all right like it will still remember your last known location important to know i've seen people die that way now with the tier two which is what i'm holding uh it does the same thing plus it will slow the ghost down to a crawl speed so the ghost is sprinting right at you and it gets close to you and you smudge it, it'll do the same thing that the tier one does, except it'll slow it down, all right? It'll make it really, really slow. Tier three, so how the tier three works is, imagine what the tier one does, except instead of with the tier two, where you end up uh, slowing it down, what the tier two will do, or what the tier three will do, is it'll make the ghost stand in its track completely, all right? It will make it freeze for six seconds which is massive, all right? So it's not moving at all. It's standing still and you're able to run away. So that's really the only different tiers when it comes to the, um, well, that's everything you need to know about the different tiers when it comes to the whole um, smudge sticks. Crucifixes. So I was kind of talking about a misconception that the ghosts won't want to touch you during a hunt with the crucifix. That is not the case at all. 
So, these are the tier 2 crucifixes. I again need to get to tier 3, but let's talk about what crucifixes do. Their job is to do one thing and one thing only. Prevent a ghost from hunting. They don't stop it if it's already hunting. But if it hasn't hunted yet, and it's within the range of the crucifix, it will prevent it. Alright, so when you're placing down a crucifix, uh, we can't see it here. But let's go inside real quick. When we're, playing down, when we're placing down a crucifix, alright, you will get a bit of a range of how much that crucifix affects. Now, tier 1s affect the least amount, and they have the least amount of charges. So, whenever a crucifix get, uh, gets used, and when it uses a charge, the crucifix will burn, letting you know that a charge has been used. And with the tier 1, you only get one charge. That is all you get. It also has the lowest amount of range. Tier 2 has two charges. All right, and it also has a slightly bigger range in the tier one. Tier three is special. Now it only has two charges, which is, it seems a little weird. I wish they put three charges, but they don't. But it has the biggest range, plus it can stop a cursed hunt if it still has both charges. So if you have a crucifix that has two charges brand new, and you're wanting to uh, get a ghost event, or you're wanting to, uh, or someone might be trolling, or you're trying to prevent a cursed hunt or whatever, you can... Not gonna lie, that's gonna be for a split second. A, cruci a, a tier three crucifix will stop a cursed hunt so long as both charges are used, or if both charges are not used. We got an EMF level four letting us know, hey, we got a ghost event, but a mare doesn't have EMF five, so this would not be an EMF five spike. That is a ghost doing a ghost event. Crucifixes, they only prevent a ghost from not hunting, but they don't stop it if it's already hunting. All right, so just keep that in mind. Also, with a demon, uh, its ranges are affected. Um, so a demon with the crucifix range, depending on which tier, um, the ranges are a little bit more affected. Um, I don't really remember the exact percentages off the top of my head. I'll just put it on the screen. Um, but the demons are affected a little bit extra with the, the effects of the range. Salt is uh, another fun little thing. Salt's main existence is for two reasons, and for two reasons only. Well, technically, if you have a tier 3. Two, um, but they have a few uses. Alright. First use. Uh, they're trying to get feet print. Uh, only ghosts that have ultraviolet will give you feet print. Again, that was changed before any ghost could give you feet prints. Now, the only ghosts that will give you feet prints are uh, ghosts that have ultraviolet. Now, the other use for salt is something known as a rape test. So... If you go into our book, and again, we're gonna, again, I'll talk more about the Wraith in a different video. Wraiths almost never touch the ground, meaning it can't be tracked by footprints. Meaning, it also says Wraiths are afraid of salt and will actively avoid it. So, what that means is the Wraith will never walk through salt. So let's say during a hunt or during a ghost event, you put the, uh, you put the salt down, it walks over the salt but doesn't step through it. You know you are dealing with a wraith. That is a wraith test, all right? Salt does not actually have an objective. It used to have an objective. It no longer has a get a ghost to walk through salt. That objective no longer exists, but you can use it to get a perfect game to fill up photos, and you can also use it to like get UV and all that type of stuff. So that is pretty much the point of salt. Now, tier three salt has an additional use though. So notice that this salt is black. Now, what's neat about the black salt is that during a hunt, it will slow the ghost down if it walks through it, unless it's a wraith, because a wraith won't walk through the salt, all right? But during a hunt, all right, let's say the ghost is a revenant, all right, and it's locked eyes with you, and you have the salt in your hand. You can place that salt down, and when it walks through the salt, right, it steps through, it will slow it down, allowing you to run away, assuming you have a place to run to, right? Now, something else to know about this salt is that you only, um, with the tier one, you only get two charges. With tier two, you get three. With tier three, you also get three, but then you get the added bonus of slowing a ghost down when it walks through, right? Which is super duper awesome. Also, with tier one, uh, it's just a small little salt pile. Tier two, it's also, uh, tier two, it's in a strip just like this as well, but it doesn't have the benefit of that. Strategically, when it comes to your um, your salt placements, and actually I forgot to mention this about your crucifixes, but let's say the ghost is in here, all right? 
if you want to be able to track a ghost and you have like salt like this you put it in the doorway and then you just do the rest like this oh the mannequin got teleported all right so putting salt in bottlenecks is an easy way to uh kind of track the ghost and the other thing and i'll talk about the crucifix which i forgot to mention which i'll just do in a moment all right and while I'm at it, I'll grab the other crucifix kind of to show the point I'm about to show. But if you're trying to get photos of the ghosts, all right, and you want an easy way to get a lot of uh, pictures, you do that. Because when this ghost steps in the salt, it'll step through all of it, allowing you to spam the pictures. Now, here's the one thing I forgot to mention. I can't believe I forgot this. Total bonehead move. But let's say the ghost is, uh, you know, let's just say the ghost is in here, all right? It's in this room, all right? So, when you're putting down the crucifix, it's wise to not just put the crucifix... Or actually, this wouldn't necessarily be the best area. Let's actually do it here. So, let's say the crucifix is in here. Or, let's say the ghost is in here. It's wise to put one crucifix here, right? But then to put the other crucifix out here instead of in that room to cover the entirety of that room. Now, the reason for that is... It's important that you have an escape route because it's wise to not just put it in the room that you're trying to prevent the ghost from hunting from, but also putting it in a place where you don't want the ghost to hunt. Because let's say um, the ghost, let's say I put both crucifixes in here, but then the ghost roams out here and then hunts here. I'm now pinned in this room because there's no hiding spot here. So I would rather want to put a crucifix right out here where if the ghost does choose to hunt, then I'm actually, then I actually, then the, it'll like, it'll, it'll make it less likely for the ghost to actually go out here and hunt. Meaning I have an escape route to this hiding spot here. So it's important to put a crucifix, not in just where you're trying to prevent the ghost from hunting, but also where you don't want it to hunt. Usually like an escape route. Because if it hunts in, because like if it hunts in the back of this room, like if it hunts all the way back here, all right? Because I'm in professional, I've got three seconds to run to get into that closet, right? But if it's hunting out here, I've got three seconds to run to somewhere else completely. If you map out all of your hiding spots at the beginning round, which I've talked about, then it won't be too big of a deal. But it's always good just to make sure you have as many escape routes as possible. Uh, I'm not really going to use a parabolic mic because here's a problem with parabolic mics. Um, they're one of those things that... So, number one, they're an objective, right? So, get a ghost or get a uh, paranormal sound with a microphone. That's really the main use for it. The second use is figuring out a banshee because, or technically, I guess, a myling as well, but I don't recommend that. I'll talk about it in just a moment. But the parabolic microphone picks up sounds that you're far away from. So, it used to, there used to be a bug that made the parabolic microphone really, really useful because it could pick up on sounds that you couldn't hear. They removed that. So... Let's say I'm all the way over here, right? And the ghost interacts with something. So first off, you can hear that it's muffling the world around me. But if the ghost, let's say, threw something over there, I could hear it. Which isn't that useful because, again, I would most likely even see it or even hear it myself. But this allows you to hear it a little bit better. Eh. So take a look. It did throw something. It is throwing stuff over here. It is possible... It is possible I might end up picking up something here. Probably not. When it, you do get a, para, a paranormal sound, it's going to be either a footstep or it could end up being some whispering. And male and female ghosts have their different whispers, but it's it's all the same. Now the banshee, or first off, I should point out that paranormal sounds happen like every so often. And the problem is, is that they're very random, but they're also not very common either. They're one of those things that you either get instantaneously or it takes a billion years for you to get it. There is no in-between. So if you don't get it right off the bat, like within the first like 10, 20 seconds, you're going to be waiting for like five minutes until you get something. Um, they are just annoying and infuriating to use. But the tier one, they have a limited range. Um, tier two, they have a better range. And then with tier three, you get the screen, which honestly isn't that useful. Now with the Banshee, what I was talking about, Banshee has a hidden ability right not or is it mentioned oh wait no it's not a hidden ability it's a there's an ability with the banshee right where every now and then you can get a particular type of screen that doesn't exist with any other type of ghost 
It's kind of like a, uh, a scream, almost kind of like a singing, which I'll play the audio for you to hear it. But that's what you'll end up hearing when it's a banshee. The Myling also has um, a bit of an ability. It does mention that it's going to be a lot more active on the parabolic microphone, which honestly pretty much means nothing because even then it's it's hardly even more active at all. You're not really going to notice a difference, unfortunately. But that is kind of the uses of the parabolic microphone. The other uses that some people kind of like when it comes to the parabolic microphone is you can track your footsteps from a safer distance during a hunt which is kind of like eh it's not really that useful but also you can only do that when the ghost is on the same level as you if you do it on a completely different floor um it's not going to work so you have to do it when it's on the same level as you and then number two that's usually not very useful at all because you're going to hear footsteps decently far anyways so tier one motion sensor uh i, I guess i'll go and show off the motion sensor but tier one motion sensor well, first off, motion sensor, it does exactly what you expect. So this is what a tier 1 motion sensor would do. Whenever you walk through, it'll kind of just, uh, it'll go off, right? Tier 2, you have the added ability of having two lines, right? Tier 3, um, you don't place it on the ground, or you don't place it on the walls, you can only place it on the ground. It's not... It's one of those things that is kind of useful, but kind of not, but it has a small range and how it'll work is it'll rotate in 360 degrees and whenever, let's say that this right here is a motion sensor, right? So what will end up happening is when the ghost enters a range, it'll immediately turn and point to where the ghost is, all right? And when it leaves that range, you know, and you, you know, it won't constantly track it but what it'll kind of do is whenever the ghost enters it, its range it'll turn to it and point where the ghost is but it doesn't constantly track the ghost just just to make that very clear it only detects it when it enters its range obviously as you can tell players can trigger it and on top of that dead players can trigger the motion sensor as well so it is something every now and then you will see players kind of uh, mess with others by just running in front of your motion sensor so that is something that happens headgear there are three tiers of it honestly tier two is the best all right so tier one it's basically a gopro you have to turn it on in order to use it um at first you just put it on and it was automatically used however now when you use it you actually have to turn it on so tier one is literally just a gopro you can go here and you can actually view their point of view not really that useful but it is something you can do Tier 2 is the one that I'm using. And it gives you a flashlight. Now, is a flashlight better than the flashlight we have now? Or the Tier 3? No, no, no. It's not. But, I mean, take a look here. You can see just enough in front of you. So, it's not a bad flashlight. You can see what's going on. It's not that bright. But because it's got a wide and far beam, even if it's not that bright, you can see everything that's going on. Meaning, you don't have to carry an additional flashlight with you, taking up an inventory slot. You can have three inventory slots with a uh, gear that's going to be a lot more helpful. Like, before I unlocked this, my setup was grab this, grab, uh, let me put this down, but grab, uh, also let me put this down as well. It was camera, EMF, and then uh, flashlight. But when you have a head mounted camera, I can ditch that for, let's say, this. And whenever a ghost touches a door, I have the UV on me. Or let's say the objective is uh, you need to get a ghost to prevent a hunting without a crucifix. If I wanted to, I could take a crucifix and then bring that in once I find the ghost room. I can immediately get that down. And then tier three. Tier three is cool, but I honestly don't think it's that useful. Tier three is night vision, which sounds awesome. The problem is, is that the vision is very, very fuzzy, and it can be kind of difficult to see in front of you. I like the tier two because it doesn't make my vision fuzzy, and I can see a lot clearer in front of me. Right. Whereas with tier three, the other problem is once the lights are on, it becomes blinding. But with the tier two, it's not. So tier two, in my opinion, is a lot more useful because you can actually use it in both the light and the dark. It doesn't make your vision fuzzy, and you can see it a lot further. Sound sensor. Um, they're not here. I haven't bought them. There's a reason for that. Um, they're literally useless. <laughs> they, they don't do anything in this game, alright? 
So as you can see here, it says offline because I haven't placed any down. But how a sound sensor works is you place it down. And whenever the ghost does something, it'll give you a level. And it'll tell you what room it's in, where it heard the sounds. And that's it. Imagine a parabolic microphone, right? Where it's picking up sounds that you yourself can already hear. Except you're not in the house when it happens. So you don't even see where it happens. Like, it doesn't show a blip on the screen. It just tells you, hey, I heard a sound. That's all it does. It tells you it just heard a sound. That's all you get to know. Not even a blip kind of like on the parabolic microphone. Because the parabolic microphone will at least let you know where it heard that sound. The par uh the sound sensor does not do that. The only difference between the sound sensor is the range of what they hear and the fact that you can change how much of a range you can hear. That that's all you get. There there's nothing else. It does not there's not an objective with it. There's not a ghost that's affected by it. It's literally useless and does absolutely nothing. Let's go ahead and get into the interesting part. And I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of a skill that right off the bat would not necessarily be the best idea. Now, I'm going against a mare, all right? I guess technically it could be a mimic, but I'm 99.9% .9 positive it's a mare. Again, there's a bit of a hidden ability that happened. But the skill I'm going to be talking about is called looping. Now, looping, like I said, is one of those things that, as a beginner, I cannot stress you enough, it is a horrible idea. However, um, when you are having a bit more hours in the game, uh, starting to loop, I mean, looping is one of those things that it's easy to learn, but hard to master. Now, remember how hunts work. Whenever you have electronic equipment on, or you're speaking, um, using your, um, your radio, your global comm, all of that, the ghost will be able to detect it. There's also a range. I didn't really talk about that, but there's a range at which each one of those can detect you at. Basically, when the ghost detects you, all right, it'll go to wherever it detected you last, and it won't speed up unless it's a revenant. Again, there's a bunch of ghosts that have exceptions. But in general, a ghost will not speed up when it detects you. A ghost will only speed up when it's in line of sight. So, how looping works is you hide behind something like this, alright? And we're going to get the ghost to come over to us. And what's going to happen is during that time, we're going to go around like this, alright? And we're literally just going to do this. Now, the key is when it comes to looping... You don't sprint a lot, all right? You only sprint when you absolutely need to, right? So if that ghost starts to speed up, you know, you do something like this, you know, you might get a little bit. But again, it's not a lot of sprinting at all. It's like light taps, like that. And during that time, you want to always make sure to have some, uh, have an eye on the ghost, all right? Now, another important thing to know about looping is let's say the ghost is starting to speed up. You're not doing too good. It's important to use doors to break line of sights. Don't hide behind doors. You used to be able to do that in Phasmophobia. If you were to do that now, all the ghost is going to do is go out and pull the door away and then immediately kill you. And we are going to trigger a cursed hunt for this, right? But I'm going to show you the basics of looping. And to make things a bit more interesting, I'm going to go ahead and have my headlight on. All right. And hide and seek. Now the ghost is somewhere over there. We're going to get in line of sight so it can kind of see us and know where we're at. Alright. Right, so the ghost is able to see us. Uh, don't get caught. Right, now this is literally the basics of looping. This is all you're doing. Like I said, it's one of those things that it's hard... It's easy to get into, but it's hard to master, right? And you always just kind of want to... And if that ghost is getting a bit too close, you just smudge it. And if you really don't want the ghost to track you, just turn off your electronics. And just like that, the ghost is going to run away. Now, we're going to get the ghost to come over here. Uh-oh, the ghost found me. Oh, well, it's done hunting. But uh-oh, the ghost is hunting. So what do you do? You just do the same thing around the car. All right? 
And that is basically how looping works. And if you really, really aren't confident, what you could do is go into uh, custom game and then make the ghost slightly slower or maybe even remove the penalty of losing your equipment on death if you really, really are scared, right? But, I mean, worst comes to worst, you just need to smudge the ghost and then run to a hiding spot, making sure your equipment is turned off and that um, the ghost isn't tracking you. But looping is one of those things, like I said, it's easy to get into, hard to master. And you can see right there, I was definitely not doing the best. I chose to smudge the ghost just to kind of show off uh, what you could do. But again, it's, it's not that difficult. But we know it's a mare, although it could technically be a mimic because we didn't really get an investigation going. And I know I didn't really show off everything because a lot of it would just require a lot of different rounds and hoping I get the right ghost. But hey, Welcome back. Like we got a mayor, and we also got the achievements. Successfully identify your first mayor. Pretty easy, uh, but because I had all the cursed objects and all of that, um, it kind of put my stuff down to zero. But anyways, that is the advanced guide. That is basically all of the stuff you need to know. Now that you're no longer a beginner, you can use all of these things to your advantage. You know how to detect an EMF-5. You know how you should place your crucifixes. You know what to do to get salt. Um, you know how the parabolic microphone works. You know how your curse objects works. And some of the practices when using all of that. I mean, you're now even learning how to loop. Which is definitely some more advanced stuff. What I'm going to end up doing is when it comes to the technical videos... Um, I will be just making a technical video on each and every single one of Ghosts rather than making a long ass video showing everything off. Instead, uh, those will all, like I said, just get their own little video. And I will be bringing up some uh, any other technical things that might go along with those Ghosts. Anyways, that is it for me. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you are new and comment if you want more guides just like this. Like I said, I am going to be uploading some 7 Days to Die very, very soon. Uh, I really hope you all enjoy that because I love that game. I'm falling in love with that game. I do want to make it very clear. Phasmo is not going anywhere. All right. I'm still going to be making content on Phasmo. It's just it's becoming a bit grindy. And also the whole genre of the zombie apocalypse. I mean, that's taking over my life. It's it's fun when you play Phasmo for over 800 hours, you know, something about that. You know, it's a breath of fresh air, you know, and also some days to die is actually kind of satisfying for me. But yeah. Discord is down in the description. I am live every single day from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll put all my other social medias in the description below. And that is it for me. But yes, I will see you all later.